Ship Show. This morning, the Labor Department released the jobs numbers for July, the non farm payroll numbers, and the expectation was for a gain of 178,000, and we beat it. We came out with 209,000 jobs, which is really not a lot of jobs. I mean, it's barely north of 200,000, and given the size of the American economy, Creating 200,000 jobs in a month is really not a lot of jobs. But when you're expecting 178,000, right, when you have a really low bar and then you exceed those rather low expectations, everybody all of a sudden is like, oh, this is great. We have a strong jobs report. And in fact, they did revise last month's gain of 222,000 up to 231. So last month's was stronger. This month's was better than estimates, but still less than the prior month. Unemployment rate did tick back down to 4.3. Remember, it jumped up to 4.4 the month before, and now it's back down to 4.3. We did have 16,000 gain in manufacturing jobs, and they did revise upward last month's gain from 1,000 to 12,000. So, you know, that's at least somewhat good news. I mean, we created some manufacturing jobs. Still, as a percentage of the overall jobs, it's small. The Labor force participation rate did uh, ratchet up one-tenth, back to 62.9, still very low. Wages rose 0.3, which was what they were expected to do. So we didn't beat there, but we didn't miss. And uh, in uh, June, the increase was just two-tenths. And everything else, average hourly earnings stayed the same, up 2.5. And the work week stayed the same at 34.5, right? So it's not a disaster of a report, right? I mean, it didn't miss uh, the numbers, but I mean, it's not spectacular. We had plenty of reports just like this uh, during the eight years of Obama. I mean, some of them were weaker, some of them were stronger, but we had plenty of reports where we had more than 200,000 jobs created in a month. Plenty of reports where average hourly earnings were up three-tenths of 1%. And of course, the unemployment rate was falling during the, you know, most of Obama's uh, tenure. Yet that didn't stop Donald Trump from tweeting, excellent jobs numbers just released. Excellent. Excellent job numbers just released. What is excellent about these numbers? In fact, if you look at the household survey, which they also uh, come out with on the same day, the household survey reveals that we created 393,000 part-time jobs during the month. That's huge. And we lost 54,000 full-time jobs. Now, Trump was complaining about this when he was a candidate. He talked about the loss of full-time jobs and the proliferation of part-time jobs. Yet now, it's excellent news. We get the same type of report that was uh, you know, a fraud when Obama was president, and now it's excellent news. In fact, you know, the unemployment rate is low. He's talking about that. When he was a candidate, he was saying, well, the real unemployment rate is like 40%. Well, what's the real unemployment rate now? I mean, is it still that high? Or is the real unemployment rate now the one that the government reports? See, the problem I have with Trump is the hypocrisy of it. I just can't stand hypocrisy. Also, the question is, was Donald Trump being honest as a candidate? Right? Did he really believe the numbers were phony? Or was he just saying that? You know, Or was he being dishonest as a candidate, and is he being honest as a president? Or was he an honest candidate, and is he being dishonest as a president? Does he realize that these numbers are BS, yet he's embracing them anyway because he thinks it's going to feather his own nest? He's going to use it as as proof that the economy is prospering under his presidency when it's it's behaving exactly the way it did under Obama's presidency, and he was very critical of the Obama presidency. In fact, again, if you look at the jobs, about 40% of the jobs created were in leisure and hospitality, which was the number one category, and then uh, healthcare and education. I mean, again, these are low-paying, part-time jobs. I mean, the last thing we want is a more expensive healthcare system, more money spent on education. Those are two parts of the economy where we're bloated. We have too much spending in those areas. And now we're going to spend more. If we keep on hiring more people in the sectors that are already bloated, 
that just screws up the economy even more. And, you know, how much longer can the the bars and the hotels and the restaurants keep hiring part time people? I mean, we have record numbers of people now tending bar and waiting tables, although we have record numbers of bartenders who are tending bar for two or three different employers. Right. That's what's going on. It's the Obamacare and the health care law that is really driving the numbers in in that category because nobody is hiring anybody full time. So now if you're a bartender, you, you don't tend bar at one bar. You you, you work multiple bars, right? You have, you have various shifts and you go from bar to bar so that nobody has to provide you with overpriced health insurance. But at some point, we're going to get a downturn in this uh, in these sectors. I mean, look, it's already happening in retail. Retail used to be up at the top, right? When I lo- used to look at the, the jobs where we were creating, it was always leisure and hospitality, education, healthcare, and retail, right? Because the retailers were hiring lots of part-time people. That's changed, right? Given the the collapse that we're seeing in retail sales, we're already starting to see a lot of layoffs uh, in the retailing space. And so it's no longer one of the top categories. How much longer before the restaurants and the bars uh, start laying people off there too? Because people aren't eating out as much either. They're not shopping and they're not eating out. And so at some point, that is going to have to turn around. You know, speaking about layoffs, Blue Apron, which I had talked about ever since the IPO, is just kind of like, you know, a canary in a coal mine here is for problems in the market. They just announced today they are laying off 25% of their workforce. Unbelievable. They just went public. They just raised $300 million to fund an expansion. And now they're contracting. 25% 25% the stock closed down another 6% today, 583. So now down better than 40% since the IPO price of $10. But what did investors give Blue Apron $300 million for if they're already contracting? Meaning they're taking the business that they had before they went public and they're making it even smaller now that they are public. I mean, the whole point of going public is supposed to be that you've got this great business that you really want to grow it. And so you just need extra capital to grow the business. So you go and you sell and you and you go public and you take the money that you raised. Blue Apron raised three hundred million dollars. Right. You think, okay, they're going to take this three hundred million dollars and scale up this great business that they have, this great business that caused them to go public. But that's not what's happening. Blue Apron didn't go public to scale up. They went public to cash out. I mean, they just sold their stock to investors, and now they're contracting their business. They're using that $300 million just to fund their losses. And they're trying to reduce their burn rate by by reducing the headcount. But this is not what IPOs are supposed to be about, right? You're supposed to be about going from a smaller company to a larger company, right? You expand. You don't just start contracting and laying people off. And so, you know, this is just more evidence of, uh, of what's been going on there and evidence of a of a market that has a lot of cracks in the foundation, like I said in my last podcast. Now, meanwhile, the market didn't react much to the jobs numbers today. I mean, we didn't get that big a pop. I mean, yes, the Dow made a record high today, but we were only up 66 points, uh, you know, still above 22,000. The NASDAQ composite was up, but just 11 points. I mean, that's, you know, barely up 0.18%. So, the market not getting much of a bounce. S&P 500 also up, but under less than 20 basis points. So not a huge run. Although, of course, we've, we've gone up a lot over the last couple of weeks. So we're just adding to those gains. The main reaction was in the Forex market and in the metals market. We saw a big spike in the dollar. The dollar had one of its best days of the year. Maybe it was the best day of the year. There haven't been too many good days this year for the dollar. Dollar index closed at 93.50. Uh, for the week. It was at a new low earlier this morning or overnight. Uh, So we did bounce, but it wasn't that big a bounce. I mean, 93.50, I think this is just some profit taking. Maybe some of the currency traders, you know, the number wasn't worse than expected. So people who were long foreign currencies, short dollars, took some profits going into the weekend. I don't think this is going to reverse the trend for the dollar. I think the dollar is still going down. And again, I don't think this is a, is a strong report. It's just another one of weak reports and a string of weak reports that are touted as being strong just because they're better than expectations. But the expectations are not high. When you're expecting an economy the size of the U.S. to add 175,000 jobs and we add 209,000 jobs, 
that is not a strong report. It's just not as weak as it could have been. And so you got that rally. Gold went the other way. Gold was flat before the number came out. In fact, gold was up around, I guess, 1270 an ounce. And it immediately sold off. I think it got down as much as maybe 14, 15 bucks. I think we closed down nine. So uh, 12, about 12.59. Silver was down 40 cents. Bigger drop in silver. In fact, silver dropped 40 cents and stayed there pretty much all day. I mean, it never recovered. Gold at least ate into some of its losses, although, again, didn't recover, didn't even get close to positive. But you had a decline in gold and silver. Now, the mining stocks did not do that bad today. I mean, about 2% drop in the XAU. The GDX was down about 1.7%. Not that big a drop, given the fact that silver was down 40 cents and uh, you know gold was down almost 10 bucks. I mean, so as I said, I think these stocks in general as a sector are kind of washed out. Uh, I, I don't think there's a lot of downside because I think these stocks already are, are pretty low relative to the current price of gold. And given what the dollar has been doing, if this trend continues, and I believe it will, there is going to be a breakout at some point in the gold price. And then these uh, these mining stocks are going to follow suit and they're going to make up for a lot of uh, lost ground. Turning to the cryptocurrencies, you know, Bitcoin is now closing back in on the highs. I mean, it's not quite back up to 3000 uh, per Bitcoin yet. We're at, I think, as I'm recording this, it's about 2830. But apparently we went through that fork. One of the reasons that people were giving for the weakness in Bitcoin when Bitcoin dropped from 3000 down to 1800 most of that happening just over a weekend where the supposed justification was nervousness over this fork because some of the miners you know they they didn't agree on, on certain things and there was a worry that uh that Bitcoin would split up I'm really not actually sure what the the uh, dynamics were about the fork but apparently uh everything is fine but there is a another coin that was created bitcoin cash and i you know this one came out of nowhere i don't know uh how it was created or if it's always been around i mean i'm not you know i don't know everything about these cryptocurrencies but and i'm not even sure if it was like like a stock spinoff i mean if you own bitcoin did you get some bitcoin cash did everybody who used to own bitcoin now do they own both currencies or did you have to go and buy bitcoin cash i'm really not sure but apparently that bitcoin cash value all of a sudden, out of nowhere, shot way up. And still, it has a market cap of $4.5 billion as I'm recording this. But it, it is down 33% on the day. So the market cap was a lot larger uh, yesterday than it is today. But it's still pretty large. But, you know, when I, I look at that and I start to think, you know, there's all these different cryptocurrencies out there. I wonder how many others use the name Bitcoin. Because when I look at this list on coinmarketcap.com, you know, and there's it there. It lists the top uh, 100 uh, cryptocurrencies, and none of them use the word Bitcoin in their name, except uh, you know this Bitcoin Cash. But I mean, what's to stop somebody from coming up with a digital currency and just you know calling it Bitcoin Plus, Bitcoin Supreme, New Bitcoin, you know, Better Bitcoin, Bitcoin 2.0, you know, Super. Bitcoin. I mean, we all kinds of different ways that you can, you know, jazz it up and make it sound like it's even better. New and improved Bitcoin. I mean, it makes me think of that. You know, that movie, uh, uh, something about Mary, where the guy comes up with this, you know, a video, seven minute abs, because, you know, there's the eight minute abs. And he's like, look, you know, I've got a great idea. I'm going to put the eight minute ab guys out of business. You know, I, I, I got the seven minute abs. And so what are you going to buy? You go to a video store and there's, you know, eight minute abs and seven minute abs, right? Which one are you going to buy? Of course, you're going to take the seven-minute abs, right? Why work an extra minute if you can get great abs in seven minutes? Who wants to have to, you know, use eight, right? So he was going to do that. I'm thinking, well, you know, why buy Bitcoin if you can buy Bitcoin Supreme or, or, or Bitcoin Plus or whatever they want to name it, right? Of course, you know, but then, you know, that the, the funny part of that movie when the, the, the guy in the car uh, basically says, well, all right, well, what happens if someone comes up with six-minute abs? And he's like, ah, no one's going to come up with six-minute abs. But, of course, you could always come up with another name. So even if you're Bitcoin Plus and now someone is Bitcoin Super Plus. I mean, what you know, you could always find a way to rebrand it. But then I started to think about it. What stops another cryptocurrency from being created? And they just call it Bitcoin, right? Because, I mean, is Bitcoin uh, trademarked or copyright? Because it's like nobody really owns, right, the Bitcoin 
network. I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but is there any is there any kind of, you know, you know, copyright trademark protection? I mean, what stops somebody else from launching a cryptocurrency and just calling it Bitcoin? And then how do you know if you got the right Bitcoin? I mean, if somebody else could launch Bitcoin, and then what if 100 people come out and launch 100 Bitcoins? It's the exact same name. It's called Bitcoin, right? But I mean, it's not Bitcoin, right? I mean, so now you got to make sure every time you're getting a Bitcoin that you're getting the right one if there's a whole bunch of them out there. I don't know. But these, again, these are all the problems that I, that, that I see coming up in the realm of these cryptocurrencies when there's no limit to the number of cryptocurrencies that can exist in the world. And probably no limit to the number of cryptocurrencies that could use Bitcoin in their name or just call themselves Bitcoin, even though they're not Bitcoin, they're just something else, but they're still utilizing a blockchain. It's just another cryptocurrency. It's not that cryptocurrency. It's a different cryptocurrency, which may have all the same properties as Bitcoin. And in fact, they may have even improved on them. It may be more, it may be easier to use. It may, you may be able to process the transactions even quicker. Uh, than you can with the existing Bitcoin. But I want to go back to the jobs because that's really all you're going to hear over the uh, over the nightly news this weekend. It's going to be about the strong jobs. Uh, Donald Trump, President Trump, excellent jobs report, excellent jobs numbers, 208,000 jobs. I mean, that is not a strong number. You know, when Ronald Reagan was president, of course, a lot of people like to say that Donald Trump well, he's the new Reagan, right? This is uh, the next uh, Reagan revolution. Well, I remember in, in 1983, I just pulled out some of these statistics. In the month of September alone, in 1983, there was a, the month of September, we added 1,114,000 jobs in one month. That's more than five times the amount of jobs that we just added in the month of July. And Trump is saying it's an excellent number compared to 101.14 million. And remember, the population of the United States is roughly 40% larger today than it was in 1983. So if you really want to make an apples to apples comparison, we would have to create 1.5 million jobs in a single month to equal what was created in 1983. And if you look at the rest of the the, the, the numbers, I'm looking at the, the, the 15 months that were subsequent to uh, that 1.114 million jobs that were created in September. Now, that was the biggest month. But take a listen to these numbers that happened in the following months. 271,000, 352,000, 356,000, 447,000, 479,000. Are you getting a picture? Huge numbers month after month after month when the population was 40% smaller. So, I mean, we would have to be printing numbers in the 600,000, 700,000 a month. So those would be really strong numbers. Those would be really excellent numbers. We're not even anywhere close to that. And especially if you think about the labor force participation rate, there are so many people who are not in the labor force who potentially could be back in the labor force. We have this huge uh, uh, supply of you know, people on the bench, basically, that we have to get them back onto the field. So we have the potential to create lots more jobs than we are, given how many people are not working. So the question is, why are we not creating those jobs? It's not like people don't need jobs. I mean, people really need jobs. They just no, There's just no good job. In fact, I read another statistic that said that all the jobs that were created so far this year, all the net new jobs, were for people who only have a high school degree or less, meaning for college-educated people, we're actually still losing jobs. So if you didn't go to college, if you just went to high school or you didn't even graduate, all right, we've been creating more jobs for you, but we haven't been creating more of the higher-paying jobs. We're creating low-paying jobs. We're creating uh, jobs for people that, that, that need to work part-time. You know, if you never saw my YouTube video where I was in uh, New Orleans, just go check that one out. I mean, that's a, that's a good, it's an underappreciated video because it only has about 200,000 views. You know, I thought I would have gotten more views, especially with my thumbnail that I, that I picked for that one. And if you've never seen it, if you go take a look at the thumbnail, you'll know what I'm talking about. But you can see that one. I think the title of it is A College Degree Worth the Cost. You decide. But, you know, these are the kinds of jobs. Go listen to the jobs that all these people have. 
that are working in New Orleans. And I know there are people that accuse me of cherry picking. Uh Uh-uh. I mean, pretty much, these are all the people I talk to. Everybody. I think maybe I I talk to maybe, maybe a half a dozen people max, probably less, that actually didn't graduate college. And I, I basically talked to everybody that I could talk to. I mean, you see how many people I talked to uh, in that. It was pretty much, I mean, I, I, it wasn't like I had to shoot hours and hours of footage to find the people. They were there. I mean, it's just like, you know, when I, when I did the video at the DNC, which that one got more than a million views. And, and there people think, well, I was just, you know, cherry picking. There I did cherry pick, but I would say that, a half to a third of the people I asked if they wanted to ban profits wanted to do it. That's still a lot of people, right? I mean, yes, I'd say it was a minority. Most people didn't want to ban profits outright. But the fact that anybody, any delegate at the, at the DNC would be so dumb as to want to ban corporate profits, make it illegal for a corporation to have a profit, the fact that I could find anybody, let alone the, the large percentage that I did find. But when I did this video on Bourbon Street, Hardly anybody didn't go to college. I mean, so this is, you know, this, this is a very, very uh, good depiction of what is going on. You know, by the way, you know, there's another video. As I was, you know, I was looking at that video. Another video that if you haven't seen it, it's a really good one to look at, is the one that, it's the cartoon one that I did, Oprah Winfrey uh, interviewing uh, Ben Bernanke. And I, 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 we made that video after Oprah Winfrey did that, um, that interview with Lance Armstrong. And I thought it was very funny, so I did a parody of it. And I always thought it was underappreciated because it only got about seventy or 80,000 views. It is very, very funny. I mean, watch that video. It's a, you'll, you'll laugh. I mean, I laugh. I just watched it the other day, and I'm laughing at it again, even though I, you know, I helped make it. I'm still, uh, I'm still laughing at it. Oh, another couple, while I'm at that, a couple of videos that I think are underappreciated. If you haven't seen them, I'll watch my YouTube videos from Mr. Schiff goes to Washington and Mr. Schiff returns to Washington. One of them, the later one, has about 100,000 views. And my first testimony has about 50,000 views. It's great uh, to watch. They're not, they're not, they're not long. Uh, but, but check those out as well. There's a lot of lists. Of course, if you go to my YouTube channel, you can go and check out all the videos that are there and, and uh, re-watch some of the ones that you might have missed or watch them again. And then share them with your friends, too. I mean, but there, there's, there's, some, there's some funny stuff there. But getting back on point... 200,000 jobs is not a lot of jobs to create in one month, especially when so many people are are absent from the labor force. So many people have left the labor force. If you're talking about excellent job creation, we need those people coming back in, right? We need those people getting jobs. And I still think that most of these jobs are just people working part-time, right? According to the household survey, we destroyed 50,000 of uh, full-time jobs. We added 350,000 or part-time jobs. It's all part-time jobs. And when you're when you're creating part-time jobs, the numbers are going to be higher because you you know, you need more part-time jobs because each person is working fewer hours. So if somebody has three part-time jobs and collectively they're only working 30 hours, if they're working 10 hours at three places, that counts as more jobs than one full-time job where you're working 40 hours. But you're probably making more money at one full-time job where you're working 40 hours than three part-time jobs where you're making 10. And especially if you have to commute. That's the worst part about part-time jobs and moonlighting and the gig economy is when you're going from one crappy job to another, the transportation cost is on you. You know, so you don't get paid for that, right? The commute time between your jobs, I mean, unless you're lucky enough to work for two bars right next door to each other, I mean, if, you know, you might lose an hour or two, you know, between jobs, just going from one to the other. And so all this is just wasted time. You got to waste money and gas. It's creating more traffic. So these are not excellent numbers. And the final thing I want to talk about is this new immigration policy. Donald Trump now wants to crack down on legal immigration, not just illegal immigration, but legal immigration. And the idea is to make sure that the people coming into the country are going to be net contributors to the economy, right? That they have skills that are in demand, that they that they speak the English language so that people who are coming in are going to be a positive addition to our society. They're not coming in just to be on welfare and to commit crimes. Now, I agree with that, right? I, I, I would like to make sure that nobody comes into this country and becomes a citizen or gets a green card 
if they're just going to go on welfare and food stamps and, and stuff like that. What, what do we need that for? But I disagree that we only need engineers and computer scientists. We need everybody. I mean, believe me, I mean, if it wasn't for immigrants, we'd have nobody picking fruit in the fields. I mean, there are a lot of jobs that American citizens won't do because they'd rather get welfare. And I don't blame them. I would rather get welfare than work most of these low paying jobs that illegal immigrants are doing. Right. And in fact, some of those illegal immigrants would probably rather get the welfare, too, if they could. But I guess when you're illegal, you can't qualify for it. Right. You're not even supposed to be here. So you're not supposed to be getting welfare, though. I'm sure there's so much fraud in our welfare system. I bet there are a lot of illegals who are collecting welfare. But that's that's beside the point that I'm trying to make to say that we only want to let in higher skilled technical people. That's wrong. I think we should let in everybody who wants to work. Now, you have this idea or this theory out there that, well, that's driving down wages because, you know, immigrants are coming in and they're working cheap. And because they're doing that, uh, the wages are lower. If there were no, let's say if immigrants didn't come in and do all these low paying jobs that Americans would rather collect welfare than do, if employers didn't have the ability to hire these people, then wages would have to rise to the point where they were high enough so that an American would want to get off his butt and actually take the job. So people think if we just keep the cheap labor out of the country, then wage rates are going to go up and then we're going to have you know better jobs. And now people, you know, let's say I'm on welfare right now and there's a job that pays eight bucks an hour and I don't want it. I'd rather get welfare than eight bucks an hour and all these you know, immigrants are taking the eight bucks an hour because they don't have the choice. And let's say the employer couldn't hire the immigrants. Maybe the, the wages would go up to 15 bucks an hour, or 20 bucks an hour. Now, OK, well, that, that's better than welfare. I'll take that job. Right. So that's what people think. But that's not what's going to happen. You see, if the illegals or immigrants are not here to do these jobs at these lower wages, the companies aren't just going to pay, you know, extraordinarily high wages to Americans. They're just going to shut down. They're just going to outsource. They're going to, you know, move their businesses offshore. In fact, there are a lot of higher paying jobs that exist only because there are lower paid immigrants, some of them illegal, who are doing the doing work that are making those higher paying jobs possible. So you take away a lot of the lower wage workers and that's the base of your pyramid. The whole thing comes tumbling down and a lot of higher income Uh, People don't have jobs either. And also, I've said this before, you go out to California, how many uh, people, how many women have jobs because they have illegal housekeepers taking care of their kids when they're at work? If a lot of women who have jobs in California had to hire legal child care, they couldn't afford to work. They'd have to quit. It's only because they've gotten illegal uh, taking care of their kids that they can afford to leave the home and have a job. So a a lot of things would happen. But I am sympathetic with what Trump is trying to do. It's just the wrong way. It's not just, you know, you have to be high skilled. And even I don't even care. Just you don't have to speak English. I mean, what if you're coming in to pick fruit or to clean dishes? You don't have to know English. There are jobs that you can do in America without speaking English. Right. So I don't mind if if somebody who only speaks Spanish or, you know, whether that matter, Italian or French or whatever they speak, if they want to come into this country and they want to work, let them come, right? More people working is a positive for the society. You know, and then when people are saying, well, you're driving down wages, you have to remember, wages are prices. It's the price of labor, right? If you can hire people for less money, you're better off. I mean, think about it. Forget about it from an employer. Most people can relate to certain things. What about a babysitter? Don't you want to be able to hire a babysitter for less money? I mean, the cheaper the babysitter is, the more likely it is you can go out to dinner with your wife or you can go out to the theater or you can do something, right? If you have to pay a babysitter a lot of money, you might not be able to afford to go out because you can't afford to go out and pay the sitter, right? If your sink is clogged and you want to, and you want to call a, a plumber, do you want the plumber to charge you a lot of money or a little bit of money? Obviously, as little as possible. If the plumber is going to charge you too much, you're probably going to try to do it yourself. You can't afford the plumber. I mean, the same thing. You take your car to be repaired. You know, you want the mechanic. You want a low price. People shop around. Lower wages are good. Remember, the price that you pay to have your car fixed, those are the mechanic's wages. Everybody pays wages. All consumers pay wages when they buy products. 
And we always shop around looking for the lowest price. So if wages are coming down, just think prices. Wages are coming down. Prices are coming down. That's good. So to the extent that immigrants come in and do more work, and because they do more work, prices come down, people have a higher standard of living. We can buy more stuff when it's less expensive. So this whole idea that we just, you know, we don't want lower skilled people coming in, that's not true. But what I would love to see Donald Trump do is have uh, immigrants. So if you come into this country, you can't be on welfare. You can't, you know, do, do, we don't want someone to become legal. Let's say we let somebody, okay, you're immigrated into the country, you're here. But for you're not allowed, or maybe for the first five or 10 years that you're here, you can't get welfare. You can't get food stamps. You can't get any of these government programs, right? So you're coming in here without a safety net. You want to come in here, you want to take a shot at working, take a shot. But if it doesn't work, go back to your home country. Don't just stay here and go on welfare. See, that way, people coming to America aren't going to come here for a handout. They're going to be coming here for the freedom and the opportunity to work their way up the ladder. That's what Trump should be talking about. Not, you know, because when he talks about, well, I want to make sure they speak English. Now, all of a sudden, they all play the race card. Oh, this is all about racism, right? And you, and you talk about we want to have skills. Now, I do think, yes, you know, if somebody has special skills that are in high demand, maybe you let them go to the front of the line, right? Because we, you know, certainly some of these higher end jobs are going to be more important to the economy. But overall, we want to let all able-bodied men and women who want to work to come into the country, right? And of course, you know, I mean, we don't want criminals coming in, make sure we're not letting in, you know, people with criminal records or terrorists. But if somebody has got the gumption to come over here, right, because they want to improve their lot in life. They want to better themselves. I want that person. Let that person in. Let that person go to work. What I don't want is someone coming in just to go on welfare, to go on food stamps, because I got to support that guy. And I don't want to support them. I, I'm fine supporting my own family, but I don't want to support somebody else's. So if you're not going to come to this country to support yourself and support your own family, then don't come in. But don't think you're going to come here and then force other people to support you. That is the distinction that Donald Trump needs to be making. Thank you.